are the same in holiness. Yeah, we could talk a little bit about the magic switch. The, the clues, when you start working with the course and you start to see that, okay, 1,200 and some pages and workbook and this and this and this, and um, the clues to the master switch are, it, it, Jesus starts his book off with, with 50 miracle principles, and uh, you can imagine if he's going to lead off his whole course with 50 miracle principles, you know, it's kind of like, Maybe there's a clue in number one. Uh, whatever he's going to choose to lead off with has got to be pretty important. Whatever Jesus Christ chooses to lead off with is number one. And, and that's, number one is that there's no order of difficulty in miracles. And that's a clue to the trap door. That's a clue to the master switch because if there's no order of difficulty in miracles, meaning there's not one that's harder than another, and, and this whole world is a world of levels and degrees and gradations and increments, and he's leading off with there's no order of difficulty in miracles, uh, he's going to come back to it and say it in a little bit different way. He's saying that there's no hierarchy of illusions. And when you look at that, no hierarchy of illusions He's saying that, that, that the entire cosmos is an illusion, and the way that you don't admit that, the way that you hold that off from healing awareness, is by making a hierarchy of the images. And you can call that judgment, uh, you can call that preferences. Uh, when I was talking to my friend Cindy this morning, she was like, I, I call, a lot of times I call people up and I hear my voice in the background, she's, she's got a video on from MMT. <laughs> she says, you're talking to me from Ireland and it's really hitting home and I love it so much. And We interrupt this video, David, or this call from David. <laughs> uh, so it's like, and, and what we were looking at in there was, she said, you're talking about preferences again. Man, do I need to hear this. Man, have I been on this wheel of preferences and spiritual preferences, and diet preferences, and ex exercise preferences, and partnership preferences, and body image preferences, and environmental preferences, and da 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 da. And, you know, that's the ooh la la that the ego says that this world offers you. It's like, what would you do without me, it says, and what would you do without all these preferences? You know, that's what makes the spice of life that's what gives this place some pizzazz, some real passion. Without that, it's just bland and boring. And I've actually heard people who said, I've listened to a lot of your tapes and talks, hundreds of hours of it, and quite frankly, you know, what you're talking about sounds really boring. <laughs> Very boring. You start to talk about sameness, and it's like, ooh, that's, that's really boring. <laughs> I don't want to go back to heaven because it's way too boring. <laughs> It's much more exciting down here on earth. Don't want to go back to oneness and sameness. But that's the trap door, you know, is really having faith that, that we are the same, that all of the images are the same, that all of the people are the same. Uh, I remember my friend Resta getting all those songs from the angels, and one of them is with her delicate little voice, we are the same, not separate. We are the same, not separate. Sameness is real. Images are the same. Differences are the same. No need to make comparisons. No need to make comparisons. Yes, comparisons, degrees, increments, gradations. It's the one thing that the deceived mind doesn't want to face is the sameness of illusions. And what is the definition of an illusion but not real? So when there's an attempt to make a hierarchy of illusions, that is simply a denial of the miracle. That's what a hierarchy of illusions is. It's denying the sameness of, of the heel mind, the whole mind. And, and that's where the ego seems to just go, that's where the rage 
and the anger and the hatred can just re just really rev up, you know, like, no, 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 no. It's like, when there is this intense anger, it is the ego's anger. Make no mistake, this is the ego's anger. The ego is angry at God for not granting reality to the cosmos. The ego is raging at God. And actually, you know how sometimes children will throw temper tantrum and they think, if I just throw it long enough and hard enough and loud enough, and if that's not working, let's make it public. <laughs> let's wait until mom and dad are in the grocery store and let's really throw it <laughs> right there in the grocery aisle <laughs> in front of everybody else. Until mom finally reaches down and says, Okay, okay, I'll get you in the, the snow cone. <laughs> it's all over a snow cone. <laughs> Just be loud enough, long enough, and public enough. And then mom goes, All right, all right, all right, all right. The snow cone is yours. And, and that's kind of what the ego is, is trying to do with God. It's going to rage and rage and rage until... Finally, God is supposed to go, all right, <laughs> all right, I'll give you your cosmos of differences and gradations and preferences, you know. All right, all right, the ego is waiting for that, that voice of God to finally cave and go, all right, all right, I'll grant reality to illusions. Think about it, that's, that's, that's what the demand is, is to grant reality to illusion. But, one problem with the ego's formulations and temper tantrum, that God wouldn't be God if God granted reality to illusion. Because God is spirit, and God gives spirit, and God creates spirit, and God extends spirit. And that's what makes God, God. And that's what makes Christ, Christ. And that's what makes spirit, spirit. It's, a, it's an extension of what it is. For God to grant reality to fantasies would make God something other than God. If God is eternal and God said, alright, I'll grant reality to the ephemeral, fluxing nature of the universe, it wouldn't work. If God said, all right, I'm eternal, but um, I'll grant reality to the temporary, God wouldn't be God. If God is infinite, and God finally said, okay, all right, all right, all right, enough, all right, enough already. I give in. I'm infinite, but I will grant reality to the finite and limited. I'm, I'm limitless, but I will, all right, I'll give in. I'll let you have your limited world, you know, then God wouldn't be God. So, what this rage is about is, is about what we're called the authority problem. And really, the authority problem comes down to the real question, who is my author? Uh, was I authored by God? Was I sourced by God? Or, as an alternative, am I the author of myself? You know, that is the core, core, core question underneath every experience of the intensity of the rage. Am I authored, or am I the author? You know, it's that choice. The ego says unequivocally, you are the author of your own reality. You know, you even read it sometimes in the New Age books. Create your own reality. Hmm, sounds pretty good. People are willing to pay good money for that. <laughs> How can I do that? Where's the conference? It's in Hawaii. Good. <laughs> How much is the airfare? I don't care. If I can go create my own reality at, uh, at airfare, not the last thing I'm going to worry about. I'll put it on my credit card. <laughs> if I can create my own reality. If you can find me a teacher or a, a workshop or a seminar that will teach me how to actually create my own reality, I got a problem then. I'll just run up $40,000 of credit card debt, and then I'll just create my own reality to be out of it. 
And, and, you know, this is the way the thinking goes. People say, well, you know, David, that's, that's, in, the, it, that's in the Course. It says we can create our reality. I said, no, that's not. That's not in the Course. Well, it's a New Age idea. Oh, well, maybe a New Age idea, but that's not a, a godly idea. That's the opposite of what the Course in Miracles is teaching. The Course in Miracles is teaching that you cannot create your own reality. All you can do is accept reality exactly as it is, exactly as it was created or is created for you. Well, talk about a surrender from thinking that you're in charge of your destiny to more like, oh, I just need to yield back in to my ultimate destiny and realize I made a big mistake <laughs> by thinking I could create my own reality. So that is, that's like where the trap door comes in. It does seem to involve a surrender, it does seem to involve a letting go, it does seem to involve a yielding, and I can just tell you that those are all just how it seems to the ego. How would you have to actually surrender something that's real to be who you already are? That's really insane. I think that you really have to let something go to be who you are. You know, that's, that's another invention of the ego, that somehow you have to sacrifice something that's real and good and valuable to know the glory that you are. If you are created as you are, and God hasn't changed God's mind, then it would simply require an acceptance. And it would not be any real relinquishment at all. I think for most people, even if you study the lives of the mystics and saints, there's this whole idea of, of renunciation. That you have to renounce something. It's going to cost you. It's going to cost you dearly. Oh, you'll be happy in the end, but it will cost you. You know, that's, that is the belief in sacrifice. And, and the only way that you experience the trapdoor, and the only way you feel the release and the relief of going through that escape hatch, is to actually allow it. I mean, in, in the sense, you know, I could read the book, and I could listen to the teachings, and so on and so forth, but until I was really into a, stepping into it and embracing it, some of you might remember that uh, that movie, What the Bleep Do We Know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I really enjoyed that movie, even though it had a little bit of Create Your Own Reality stuff in it. I could easily forget that. <laughs> uh, and what I really liked, I think the best part of the movie was at the very end of the movie, the final scene of the movie, is Fred Allen Wolf and his wacky hair, and his wacky crazy eyes, going, don't just take my word for it, try it out for yourself, with his twinkly eyes and his wacky hair. What a great ending to a movie about quantum physics. Don't take my word for it, try it out yourself. Jump into the how. If these quantum ideas seem a little exciting to you, the idea of connectivity, the idea of, of no loss, the idea that we're all one, if, the idea that everything is energy, that there's really not material and energy, that everything is ultimately energy, everything is completely connected. You know, he's saying, don't just take my word for it. Don't take the word of all these scientists and all these different teachers and writers and speakers that have just been going on for the last few hours. Try it out for yourself. That's the thing I loved about Gandhi. You know, I remember when I was reading the autobiography that Gandhi wrote. What, what I really liked about Gandhi was he was, in his own words, experimenting with the truth. He was experimenting with the truth. And what do we know about an experiment? If, if we were to think back to science class, what good would it do to read the lab book, read all the notes, and then show up and just sit there and not do the experiment? You know, you still would have a little bit of doubt in your mind. If you mix this and this and this, will it really 
produce that. Like the book says, you know, what about actually experimenting with it? What about actually just doing it, trying it? Uh, it's kind of like in What the Bleep Do We Know, they actually re-edited the movie and they, they renamed the second edition of it, Down the Rabbit Hole. <laughs> Isn't that a great title for a quantum physics movie, Down the Rabbit Hole? Because what is that referring to except the fairy tale, you know, Alice in Wonderland going down the rabbit hole. When she goes down the rabbit hole, everything is different. Nothing is the way she thought it would be. And we know the Mad Hatter <laughs> is actually down there when you go down that rabbit hole. But she, she went down it, you know. She went down it. And so, to me, we can talk about the ideas. I can talk about uh, divine providence, that life takes care, that if you really follow your heart, if you really jump, if you really leap, if you really go for it, <coughs> yeah, you're listening to Jesus' words, you're reading them on the, the course and everything, and all of those 1,200 words are really just summarized in an invitation. He's like saying in there, come and join me. Like jump in the water, it's, the water's warm. Believe me, it, it is not shocking. <laughs> this pool that I'm in, this pool of joy and love that I'm bathing in, that I am, is wonderful. Wonderful but beyond anything you can imagine. So he's, I think that's really what he's saying underneath those 1,200 and some pages is just jump in. Just join me. And as you jump, then you'll have experiences. And those experiences will show you for sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, of what I'm talking about. It's not going to be the concepts. If you memorize this, whatever, theology of A Course in Miracles, you may be quite eloquent at talking about it. And you may say, oh, I, I like Jesus. Sentimentally, I like him. <laughs> Practically speaking, but sentimentally, I'm with him. And he's just saying, keep coming. Let's just tip, tip, tip that sentimentally. Just let it just tip over into actuality. Let it tip over into full practicality. Whatever those doubt thoughts are, Jesus is saying, go ahead and let them ar arise. And he, I think he's really saying that, that if you've been following an insane belief system, and you've been trying to follow it as best you can, and you've tried to take logical, practical steps based on this insane thought system, you're going to have to jump off of that logic. You're going to have to jump off of that practicality. You're going to have to, you know, jump away from everything that mom and dad taught you in this world, and siblings, and books, and, and schools, and on and on and on. And you're just going to have to trust me. He's like, if it helps you, picture yourself taking my hand. You know, at one point he says even, because, because it seems like a radical... Leap. I know for me, even contemplating this journey, you know, I just felt like, wow, I really don't know for sure if this leap is going to provide me what I think it's going to provide, but I, but I am willing to take it. I'm willing to take the leap and just <coughs> give it a try. I'm willing to, to actually put it into practice and try it and see if it works. And that will make all the difference. Uh, it's, the ego is so ingenious that it can even kind of get you on a pathway of talking about it, or just studying it. <laughs> ego would, even Jesus even says in the Course, the ego enjoys studying itself. That should be a warning. <laughs> or, okay, I'm only going to go so far with the studying part. <laughs> Because if the ego enjoys studying itself, I might just drift into some kind of a long loop 
and end up studying for years and years and going, what? Where did what 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 did I do wrong? So, so that's really what we're we're calling into, and in one sense, you know, it's like that's part of. Uh, I think that was part of why you came here, you know, why why you left Louisiana. Uh, you came up to Kentucky, you felt something, there was some kind of an invitation there. You came and you had that experience of that just absolute stark raving insanity and madness and it's like, okay, back away, step away. And even in doing that, you still felt the presence there. I am with you. You didn't, you didn't really back away, you didn't, you didn't throw anything away, you didn't do anything wrong. That presence was still, that underlying current was still there. That I love you was still there. And I think that's important that, that you know that, that taking these kind of steps, there is that allowance for you to, to drop down and to move through this. You know, we, we are not into producing anything, we're not into fixing anything, making anything, making the world a better place. You know, the more that you're with this vibe, you see that there's a pause, there's a stillness there that is not busy, that is not distracted, but it's, it's actually this true, like, deep pool of stillness that is still that invitation. And when the ego rears up about something specific, it's never really about the specific. It's about wanting God to grant reality to fantasy. That's the, that's the venom underneath whatever the specific thing seems to be. The ego is ingenious at projecting that venom onto specific forms, specific people, specific circumstances, specific things. That's why it made the world. You know, sometimes you've heard of something being like a punching bag. This, this is Projectionville. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was made as a dumping ground. It was made to try to get rid of something and yet still keep it. Does that sound like a contradiction? <laughs> to get rid of it and yet still keep it. That's what projection does. It gives you the illusion that you can fire away and, and blame and see the cause outside while still clinging to the cause on the inside, while still believing in the cause. And, and trick yourself into thinking, I got rid of it. <laughs> I blasted them. I blasted them good. I blew them over with my venom and rage. And uh, they'll think twice before they try try anything on me again. <laughs> got it off my chest? Oh, 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 I got it off my chest. I blew them over with my anger. And then what follows that projection is guilt. Guilt always follows the attempt to, to project something and to blame. Because somewhere in mind you know you're not getting away with it. You know, you may try to trick yourself in the moment, but, but guilt surely follows. People feel bad after they've lashed out. People always eventually feel terrible, feel rotten when they've lashed out. Guilt always follows that projection. And we, we are starting to get wise to start to realize that we can't get rid of our hurt and anger and pain by projecting it. We have to allow it to be raised up into awareness and we have to offer it to the Holy Spirit. We can't, we can't keep it and neither can we project it. It's intolerable to try to hold it in and keep it and it's intolerable to try to project it because we, you know, we, after a while we see who are we really fooling. You know, this is not working. It's not going away. You know, it may minimize it a little bit in the instant when we feel like we've blasted somebody and we think like, wow, I know doormat. And now they know for sure that I'm no doormat. And they've, 
they mess with me again, I'm gonna give it to them with both barrels. And I go, I'll get a, I'll get a shotgun now. I'll get a, I'll get a machine gun. No, I'm gonna Uzi. I'm gonna really give it to them, and they won't mess with me again. And then, oh, I feel bad. I, okay, I, I loaded a few rounds there from the machine gun. And I thought it would make me feel better, but oops. I feel bad, you know. It never, ever, ever yeah. brings about release. You know how Jesus says, anger is never justified. He says, one paragraph later, pardon is always justified. Because the conditions for which the anger arose were illusory. They were deception. There was never a time when we could say, I was justifiably angry. Not one single instant in time and space can I honestly ever say that I was justifiably angry. It was just another oops, <laughs> you know, if I'm really willing to admit it. So just by, by being willing to not hide it and not stuff it down and not stay with the game of projection, then you're heading for the trap door. And it's intense, because again, it's the ego's anger. It's not your anger. In the end, you can't really own that anger, because you can't own up to the ego. You, you have to simply not protect it, and have the trust to not protect it. And that's what we're doing every day. Every day when we have expression sessions, you're trusting that it's okay to expose it that this will bring about a miracle, this will, this will lead me to safety. Not exposing will only stuff it back down, and exposing will actually bring me into that, that safety that I seek. Yeah, I, I, now that you say that, that um, and you had said something earlier about going into the full experience of it, and, um, and I, there's still very much um, a very deep fear of allowing it up fully because there's because I don't know what it'll look like if I allow that. And Suzanne was there with me last night, and I I can see myself, you know, like really put, putting the lid on it, and, and that makes sense. That would be the trap door by allowing it. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. you if, if you can. If you can allow that with the Mighty Companion, fine. And at times, I know, I, when I was going through some of this stuff, it's just like, <laughs> I was praying if there would be a Mighty Companion I could do it with, and, you know, Jesus was like, Hermitage. <laughs> 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 you know, it's Hermitage. You can, you could blast the cave walls, you could blast the, the walls, you know. And, and in one sense, for me, that was... <coughs> That was just like, okay, you, you show the way, you give me the thing. But that was part of it too. Even in, you know, there's, there's a lot of spiritualities that talk about, you know, expressing it. And for me, I don't think it was ever so much about expressing the anger, but it was about not trying to hold it in, or hold it back, or stuff it down. It was definitely about that. I didn't know the form that would play out. But I definitely knew I wasn't stuffing that back down, and I wasn't going to hold it in anymore. And I just prayed, did a lot of praying. And at times you feel real schizophrenic, you know, here you are on the spiritual journey, and you're just raving, raging like a maniac. <laughs> and the spirit's like, back there in your mind, so, this is good, I gotcha, I gotcha, I'm there for you, I'm there for you, I'm, I'm still there for you, you know. And that's, that presence does lift us up, it carries us through. It works. It really works. We are the same.